Let's pray together. God, as we have come together in these moments, I thank you for the opportunity to worship. I thank you for these songs. I thank you for the scripture that we're going to have as we look to your word and continue in our series, The Cycle of Victorious Living. Thank you that we have learned and continue to learn to fret not. I pray that you would help us also to continue to learn to commit hands down our way to you. And today, as we talk about trust, I pray that you would be with us and that you would guide us in our time together. God, I pray that you would be with each one that needs a touch from you. You know the circumstances surrounding each prayer request. And God, our list is long and we continue to place all of them in your hands. Specifically, we think of Jaden Southard, you know, tested positive for coronavirus uh, this week. 
I pray, God, that you would be with Kelly and with little Landry. I pray that you would just protect them and uh, that you would help Jaden's symptoms to be mild. God, I pray that you would be with Jerome Nestor as he prepares for surgery on November 13th, be with him and his family. God, I pray that you would continue to be with Mike Benton. Thank you for a successful procedure this week with the pacemaker. God, I pray for Bobby and Barbara Somerville. We continue to lift Leanne Blissett and Rod Chapman, Irma Bailey. I uh, pray you'd be close to Walter and Mildred Scroggs. You know the touch that they need. And God, um, so many on our prayer list, and all we know to do is to give them to you. So we do that in this moment, asking you to do what only you can as our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer, our healer. And I pray that you would remind us that you are with us on this journey. Be with us in our continued giving and stewardship. I pray that you would bless the gift and the giver and that you would help us as we continue to build the kingdom here at Cornerstone. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm excited as we continue our cycle of Victorious Living series. I remind you that the first week we talked about fret not. Um, fret is the exit ramp from the cycle of Victorious Living. Last week we talked about the entrance ramp onto the cycle of Victorious Living, which is to commit hands down our way to the Lord. And today we talk about the next step in continuing on this path, and that is to trust. Now, trust is a small word that is powerful in meaning. Um, we all know that you have to gain trust. And we also know that once you lose trust, it's difficult to rebuild it. Um, it's actually many times harder to rebuild than it is to gain in the first place. Well, we are talking about trust in God. And that trust um, is built on an eternity of faithfulness. And so as we trust in him, we know that he has proven himself trustworthy. Um, but as we think about trust, there were some things that came to mind that I wanted to share. Um, naturally, we think about marriage. We think about friendships and relationships. We think about business dealings whenever we talk about trust. Um, but there were two illustrations that I wanted to share with you from my own life. The first one is a little lighthearted, and then the second one is a little more serious. Um, the first was probably when I was around nine or ten years old. We were camping with another family from the church there in Glenwood. Um, it's the only time I remember going camping with my parents and my two brothers. And we had just finished lunch, and they were serving watermelon. Well, the only way to have watermelon is with salt on it. That's my feeling anyway. Um, if you feel differently, you don't have to let me know. But my younger brother was probably six or seven at the time, and the daughter from the other family was actually one day older than him. That's how our moms met, was in the hospital. They shared a room. But I offered to salt Pam and Greg's watermelon. Well, Greg was willing, but Pam spoke up quickly and said, No, I only trust Mama or Daddy or Billy or Bobby. Billy and Bobby are her older brothers. They were probably around 15 at the time. But I never will forget when she said, no, these are the only people I trust, Greg's eyes got really big and he spoke with a shocked voice that said, you don't even trust Ray Thornton? Now, if you've lived in Arkansas for uh, several years, you may remember that Ray Thornton was uh, a representative from Arkansas to the House of Representatives. And uh, during one of his campaigns, he used that slogan, Ray Thornton, you can trust his judgment. And Greg took it to mean all the way to salting watermelon. Well, the second experience was when I was a resident advisor at Southern Nazarene University. As part of our training, we went to a ropes course at Oklahoma State University. While we were there, um, some of you've heard me share the story before of being up in the treetops and being roped in, the rope attached to a cable overhead, and it was also attached to a carabiner, which was attached to a harness that you were wearing. And so you were roped in the entire time and you were safe. And so the goal that they gave us when we began this journey into the treetops was that each one of us would make it from point A to B to C all the way to the end and the zip line which was the reward, and it was great. 
Um, but each teammate was supposed to get there. Well, there were some that it was pretty easy. They just jumped right on through. And then there were others that had to be coaxed and encouraged along the way. But we were a team at that point, but that was the afternoon. The team building actually happened in the morning through several different trust exercises that we had to go through together. A couple of those were trust falls. One of them was a team trust fall where you would stand on a platform and then you would fall backwards into the arms of your team. They were standing facing one another with their arms weaved all the way down so it gave a strong platform for you to fall into, but still it was like taking the nest plunge and so it wasn't really easy to do. The other was partner trust falls where you would simply partner up with someone ab about your same size and you would do these trust falls and you would uh, make it through several before you would switch and go the other way. Well, Karen and I are gonna illustrate that and we're not about the same size, so we're not gonna uh, reciprocate with me uh, falling on her. But I do want you to remember that we are trained professionals. Do not try this at home. Um, if one of you were to drop your spouse, I don't wanna be responsible. So again, do not try this at home, but Karen's coming to help me illustrate these trust falls. So she will stand facing away from me and I will ask her, I will say, uh, I will actually say ready and she'll say ready and I will say fall on. Now I will position myself ready to break her fall and you start pretty close. So ready. Ready. Fall on. That's not too bad. I'll take a little step back. Ready. Ready. Fall on. A little bit more trust involved there. Let's go just one more step. You still good with this? Yes. Okay. Ready. Ready. Fall on. Whew. I'm glad that went well. In their respective writings of the book, The Cycle of Victorious Living, um, Pastor Earl Lee refers to his chapter as trust, lean hard. Uh, Dr. Daniels refers to his as trust, leapers, and calculators. Well, at the beginning, Dr. Daniels always gives a quote from Earl Lee in his book. And so the quote begins this way, Pastor, I have really committed everything, including myself, to the Lord. Now what do I do? Asked one congregation member. There's only one thing to do, Pastor Lee said. You have changed from independence to dependence. You don't just lean, you lean on someone well able to carry your weight. The one who created the heavens and the earth and who never fails. Lean hard. Well, Dr. Daniels calls his chapter Leapers and Calculators. He explains it this way. The ability to trust by faith in the Lord is ultimately a gift of God's Spirit. But I am convinced that some people by nature receive and respond to the gift of trust and faith more naturally than others. I think people tend to either be leapers or calculators. Leapers are those people who seem to embrace the challenges of faith with little effort. The ones that I described in the treetops as just jumping like a squirrel, like no big deal. Um, they are natural born risk takers who are often able to translate that boldness into their journey with God. Calculators, on the other hand, are people who tend by nature to be analytical. Uh, whenever an opportunity emerges that may require a leap of faith, Calculators immediately start analyzing the risks and the benefits. Um, so leapers usually carry around a journal that says, this is what God did, this is what God did, this is what God did. They carry that around in their backpack as they leap from mountaintop to mountaintop and do whatever um, the leapers do. Calculators tend to carry around that legal pad and they have the line drawn down the middle and it says pros and cons and they try to decide what's the best way to go. Now, there's not a right or a wrong. God created all of us. And so God uses leapers and God uses calculators. 
um, in any business that you've seen that is successful, on their board, you will see that there are some leapers and there are some calculators. And there are some leapers who would jump right off a cliff if there, if there wasn't a calculator there to say, you know what, um, if you leap here, you're gonna fall off the edge. So both are important, um, but we must remember that we don't need to jump too quickly sometimes, but we also don't need to calculate to the point of being out of God's will and stopping what God is trying to do. Well, Dr. Daniels gives fun illustrations concerning his own family. Uh, he said his wife, Debbie, is a leaper and he himself is a calculator. They have four children, three boys and a girl. And he said, early on, we began to watch them and they, they developed the plan to watch them at the pool to decide who was gonna be a leaper and who was gonna be a calculator. He says, Caleb, our oldest, is a calculator, and that's unfortunate because of his biblical namesake being clearly a leaper. Um, but Scott says, you know, he's like me. And so um, whenever we started to go to the pool, um, he would get there and he would size up everybody else in the pool. And if there weren't too many rough looking kids and it didn't look like he was going to be bullied that day, then he would go and he would try to find a spot where he wouldn't land on another swimmer and he might jump in at that point. But there were days that they wouldn't even enter the gate because it looked too rough for him. Their second son, Noah, is a leaper, much like his biblical namesake and he said we'd pull up the door would open and he would yell cannonball before he even hit the gate and people better just get out of the way because he was jumping in he says our third son jonah um, much like his biblical namesake is a calculator almost to a problematic degree if jonah calculated that it was a day worth leaving home then he might join us on a trip to the pool once he got to the pool he was happy sitting on the side with his feet in the water for 20 or 30 minutes. If that went well, he would move to the first step and he would sit there for 20 or 30 minutes. He was very satisfied just to, to be there in the safety of the shallow end. He said there were a few times that before we left the pool, Jonah even got his hair wet. Their third child, Sophie, is a leaper. Her favorite at the pool was to have a popsicle, and sometimes she would have two or three before she ever made her way to the pool. But once she started for the pool and she, she yelled, hey dad, I'm jumping in, Scott said, it didn't matter if I was on the other end of the pool, she's jumping in the deep end and I need to get there. She trusted that if she jumped in, that I would be there and I would get her before she drowned, he says. Now, he says this, um, I don't think calculators offend God. In fact, I'm quite sure he created us with our analytical natures on purpose. Calculators often rise to important levels of leadership. He said, that's why I always feel bad for King Ahaz. He says, if you open any handbook of the Bible and turn to the section on the good and bad kings of Israel and Judah, Ahaz inevitably makes the bad king list. So, I'm going to share with you the story of Ahaz as Dr. Daniels shares it in his writing of the book. He says in 1 Samuel 8, the people of Israel demanded that a king be placed over them so they could be like all the other nations. This was displeasing to both Samuel and the Lord, but after warning them that they would not like having a king, they continued to insist. Now, it only took three kings in. Saul and then David and then Solomon, for them to realize that all the problems that God had warned them about were reasons that they should have not had a king. The nation divided into two, with ten tribes going north and forming the nation of Ephraim, or Israel, with its capital city of Samaria. The remaining two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, remained in the south and maintained the capital city of Jerusalem. In 722 BC, the powerful nation of Assyria conquered and utterly destroyed Ephraim. Judah was able to hold off Assyria, but Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar took them captive in 587 BC. Ahaz was the Judean ruler in Jerusalem for, from approximately 735 to 715 BC, and his reign is described 
three places in the Bible, in 2 Kings 16, Isaiah 7 through 9, and 2 Chronicles 28. Our focus from Dr. Daniel's writings will be from the book of Isaiah. <clears throat> Christians, he says, tend to read Isaiah 7 through 9 during Advent because of the ways Matthew interprets these texts in the light of the life of Jesus. When we read the prophets, however, we need to read them at three levels, he says. The first is the original context. What did this prophetic text mean to the original audience? The second would be the prophetic text and how it fits in with the Messiah expectations and therefore is rightly associated with the life of Jesus Christ. The third one that many of us often ignore, he says, are the prophetic hopes that still speak to the kind of leader that God needs for his people today. So if we start at the original text, these chapters in Isaiah fall during the reign of Ahaz around 735 BC. Now in that year, Ahaz has a huge problem. King Rezin of Aram, Syria, and King Pekah of Ephraim, Israel, had created a coalition in an attempt to forge alliances among the smaller nations in order to try to withstand the impending invasion from Assyria to the north. Pekah, the king of Ephraim, had tried to get Jotham, the father of Ahaz, to join the alliance against Assyria, but had no success. So he, with the help of Rezin of Aram, uh, decided to send an army to Jerusalem to replace King Jotham with a puppet king that would go along with them. But before that plan could fall into place, Jotham died, and his son Ahaz was left to face the crisis. So in the midst of his fear, Isaiah comes to him, and the great prophet gives Ahaz a message from the Lord, a simple message of trust. Take heed, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint. That's Isaiah 7, 4. He even invites Ahaz to ask for a sign from the Lord as assurance of his promised deliverance. In verse 11, he says that sign could be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz calculated. And here's where he got into trouble. And this is where calculators can get into trouble. He took God out of the equation. He sat down with his legal pad and he began to make his list and it just didn't add up for him to just trust and be quiet and not fear. Um, it didn't make sense for him to wait and let the Lord act. He began to think about what he should do and when it didn't add up, he tried to make it sound spiritual when he said he didn't want to put God to the test. But it was simply a decision to not trust. The inability to trust the Lord would lead Ahaz to make an unholy alliance with Tiglath-Pileser III, the king of Assyria. Dr. Daniel says, like the scene out of a mafia movie, Ahaz melted down the gold from the temple and paid off Assyria for protection. The king of Assyria used the increased wealth and power to destroy Aram and Rezin and all their people and became the, nation, the region's superpower. This is the way that many of us do things. Um, we sit down and we try to calculate, we try to figure it out, and if we take God out of the equation, that's where danger comes in. We start looking for a detour around trust. That detour will take us back to fret. Fretting is what caused him to make this decision. Fear is what caused him to make this decision. The prophet recognized the faithlessness of Ahaz and proclaimed this in Isaiah 7, 13 through 16. Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you <clears throat> to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse, refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to 
refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. Now, given the time frame and the, the context here, most scholars assume that when we read the text at the first level, that the prophet is speaking about Hezekiah. Traditionally, the time for a child to know the difference between right and wrong and evil and good is about the age of 12. So the prophet is telling Ahaz that within 12 years, the two nations he is concerned about will no longer even be a threat. But in that time, God would anoint a new leader from within the house of Ahaz who would have a different name, a reputation other than Ahaz. Whereas Ahaz refused to trust God, this new leader would do and be something that Ahaz had failed to do. He would be a reminder to all the people that God is with us. King Ahaz lacked the faith to trust God and instead placed his trust in armies and alliances. He calculated the odds and when push came to shove, he chose what he thought was necessary to preserve the nation and his own position. In the end, however, he lost both. Isaiah 36 and 37 tell the story of his son, Hezekiah. In the 14th year of his reign, King Sennacherib, the new king of Assyria, came to collect on the debts of Ahaz and threatened to bring his army up against Jerusalem. He sent his messenger to the gates of Jerusalem to threaten the people. Do not let Hezekiah mislead you by saying, the Lord will save us. Has any of the gods of the nation saved their land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? That's Isaiah 36, 18. Hezekiah and Jerusalem were in almost an identical situation as his father Ahaz. If the calculations that kept Ahaz from trusting the Lord were overwhelming, the odds that now faced Hezekiah were insurmountable. No nation had been able to stand against Assyria, and Judah would be no exception, they warned. But just like his father, Hezekiah received a word from the prophet. In Isaiah 37, verses 6 and 7, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled me. I myself will put a spirit in him, so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land. I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Ahaz and Hezekiah, similar threat, same message. Trust in the Lord, but a different response followed. Ahaz calculated the threat and failed to trust in the Lord. Hezekiah, in Isaiah 37, took the full letter from the Assyrians and directly took it to the temple, spread it out before the Lord, and laying himself on the ground, he prayed to Yahweh. Isaiah 37, verses 16 through 20. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations in their lands and have hurled their gods into the fire, though they were no gods but the work of human hands, wood and stone, and so they were destroyed. So now, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. As he lay before the Lord, it was as if he leapt in faith and trust in God's deliverance. Hezekiah became what Isaiah expected he would become. He became the fulfillment, the Emmanuel king for that generation. He reminded the people of God's promises and that God is with us. Now, in Isaiah 7, Matthew takes that. In Matthew 1, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Jesus, in his life, death, and resurrection, is the ultimate fulfillment of God's expectations and the forever reminder that God is with us. Jesus was one who followed God wholeheartedly. 
But Dr. Daniels points out that in the Garden of Gethsemane, there was a calculating moment for him. There was the, the moment where he said, Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. It's almost as if he had that legal pad there. Do I follow after the one who sent me or do I make an alliance and, and get into an alliance with the Pharisees? Do, do I follow the plan even though it means death or do I do the easy road? Do I take the detour? We know and we are thankful that he followed the path that was given him. He leapt in faith even though it took him to the cross. We worship Jesus as Christ and as the fulfillment of all of Israel and Judah's messianic hopes because he was obedient to the will of the Father and in trust he gave himself up to death. God is still looking for men and women who will follow after his heart, who will trust him even whenever it seems the only way is to keep God in the equation. Because we can sit down and we can say, oh, this that we're facing, you want me to do what? You want, but that doesn't make sense. Now, there are times that we calculate and we're able to see that maybe we do need together with God to go a different direction. And he guides us in that. But we must be careful in our calculations that we don't take God out of the equation and that we don't, like Ahaz, look for a detour around trust. He calls us to trust. He expects us to trust. And he rewards that trust as we continue on this journey of faith. We enter the cycle of victorious living by committing our way to the Lord. We move along the life of shalom by learning to lean hard in trust upon him. God is with us. The closing of Dr. Daniel's chapter again includes a quote from Pastor Lee. He says this that I think we can all relate to. I'm sure you realize it is possible anywhere along life's journey for fret to set in. Satan will not cease his efforts to get us out of orbit. He usually attacks the mind and seeks to insert insidious little doubts that, if allowed to, will easily start us toward fret. God's call for us not to fret is not only a requirement for entering the cycle, but also a requirement for remaining in it. The opportunity to fret will always be present, but as trust becomes more and more our way of life, we become less aware of the assaults on our faith. I close this week with the same song I closed with last week, The Goodness of God. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God and I will trust in him because he is faithful and he is trustworthy. And even if I sit down to calculate the best way to go, I will trust and I will follow when he asks me to go.